Welcome to The Branding Boardroom, the podcast where we discuss brand strategy and how it should be understood, formulated, and implemented by senior corporate decision makers. Our guests range from prominent CEOs to accomplished academics and thought leaders. But there's so much more. They're also interesting people. Now follow me into The Branding Boardroom. Dennis Yu is a prominent digital marketing expert and public speaker with over 30 years of high-level experience. He has held executive positions at Yahoo and American Airlines, among other companies, and has managed marketing campaigns for global brands such as Nike and Rosetta Stone. During his career, Dennis has been in charge of campaigns worth over $1 billion for agencies he manages or advises. He's currently the Chief Technology Officer of Blitzmetrics, a digital marketing company that partners with schools to train young adults and aims to create 1 million new jobs globally. It's my great pleasure to welcome today on the Branding Boardroom, the one and only Dennis Yu. How are you doing, Dennis? Hey, Yuval. How are you doing? I'm all right. Where are you calling from today? We're in Washington, D.C. That's very good. I think that uh, we all know that you travel a lot and you work with uh, a lot of clients. And I think that uh, our audience already knows that you have a very exciting lifestyle and a great career. But let's start by talking a little bit about how you got there. How did your career start? What is your story? And how did you get to where you are today and to this level of success? I'm an American-born Chinese, <clears throat> which is what we call an ABC. I didn't speak English until I was six. And like the typical Chinese child, I was good at math and I enjoyed competing in you know, math kinds of things, but I didn't have the social skills. I didn't know how to communicate. I was made fun of. And it wasn't until I had mentors. I was just very fortunate that I had the CEO of American Airlines to be a mentor of mine. And he just kind of adopted me in, in some kind of way. And he got me my first job, and I built the website for American Airlines back in the mid-90s, almost 30 years ago. You can see, that's when I had a lot more hair. And I just learned so much from being there in the early days, but it wouldn't have been possible unless I was able to gather all the data. So <clears throat> my particular advantage was working with really large data sets. And so while there's a lot of people that will work on like the overall brand and advertising campaigns, <clears throat> I always looked at it from the, from the bottom up which is every inter individual transaction, every phone call, every email, every time they've complained, every time they've clicked like on an Instagram post, and the measurement of a brand, we've looked at it as how do we sum all of those and be able to create lots of different micro segments, personalized against those segments, so that each customer has a highly personalized journey and figure out the value of the brand from trying to increase the personalization, increase the engagement rate, increase the lifetime value that then results in the overall, you know, financial stock market value of the company or how much, you know, the brand is worth from an advertising standpoint or how much awareness they have. But uh, coming from the background of somebody who has worked extensively with data and somebody who also builds businesses and scales things up, do you think that data can tell us everything and what types of things can data tell us and what types of things maybe it cannot? Well, data is not everything. It's like left brain and right brain. It's like doing surveys that are quantitative versus qualitative, right? Data can quantitatively tell us how many times people bought. They can tell us when a customer left. They can tell us what they bought, but they can't tell us why. So I see a lot of mistakes, like we did work with Jack Daniels, which is a major whiskey brand. And then we came in and said, well, wait a minute, Jack Daniels is an international brand. Jack Daniels has a different perception in Brazil than in the United States. And with Jack Daniels launching other flavors besides Tennessee whiskey, so there's Tennessee honey, and there's a fireball, which is cinnamon flavored, and there's apple, and there's different demographics. So we had like a mobile DJ booth that went into Chicago, into like the poorer parts of town, and, and had a different view than this, the southern white man whiskey drinking, pickup truck driving. But we found through the data that there were many, many different pockets that, we, that were loyal to the brand, but for different reasons. You uh, are working, I'm guessing, mainly on Blitzmetric these days and um, 
perhaps on some other projects. Uh, so when people ask you, what do you do? Uh, what do you tell them? And what does also Blitzmetrics do? I am here to create a million jobs. That is my life's mission. I retired 20 years ago. I was very lucky <clears throat> just being in the right place at the right time. I'm not any smarter than anyone else. I'm not any more special. I just happened to you know, be in the right place at the right time in a few different situations that made some money. And I'd like nothing more than to give back. What made the biggest impact on my life, Evo, was having a mentor when I had nothing, when I had no connections, and be able to train me, and be able to meet you know, sitting presidents of the United States and have dinner with people like this, or Margaret Thatcher, or I had dinner with Herb Kelleher, who was the founder of Southwest Airlines, or the CEO of Goldman Sachs. I mean, how awesome is that, right? I would never have opportunities like this. But someone else opened a door for me. Then I thought, how do I do that on a much larger scale? So I started taking people under my wing. I'm not going to get on my high horse here, but there's a significant issue with the education system where a degree doesn't necessarily equal a job. So I want to bridge that by having apprenticeship, actual real world experience, not an internship, but real, you know, as you're going through school, learn how to actually take on clients and start an agency. Well, we all understand <clears throat> that we live in a global economy. And whoever can render that product or service at the same quality but for cheaper is going to be able to win or render it at higher quality and get more money. So when it comes to things like digital agencies and helping local service businesses, for example, the funny thing is that you could be a local business like a dentist in Miami, Florida or a chiropractor in Denver, Colorado, but the work can be done by someone in Beijing, right? Or it could be a business in London, but the work can be done by someone in Pakistan. And you saw with COVID, the move towards digital means that you don't physically have to be there. What about localization? What about someone who is a student in Beijing? Can they really do work for a personal injury attorney in Atlanta or work for Coca-Cola you know, in Atlanta? Well, yes and no, because there's cultural differences for those particular consumers. But then again, Coke being a multinational company is going to want to employ people who understand all the different kinds of cultures. Last month, I was in Kosovo, which is a country of 2 million people. And my friend Benjamin Kolonovic has 40% of the ad spend in that country. He is a dominant player. He started this agency two years ago during COVID, and now he's the number one player by far. We were eating Kentucky Fried Chicken. I took a picture of myself and him eating fried chicken and I tagged Kentucky Fried Chicken in the post on Facebook. And I verified I have a million followers and Kentucky Fried Chicken replied. <laughs> and I thought, wow, this is so cool. And I said, it's someone on your team, isn't it, Ben, that's replying? And he said, yes. And he told me that he was so successful with mobile ordering in Kosovo that he caused KFC to run out of chicken in the country. <laughs> And I thought, wow, this only would have been possible in Kosovo given their particular conditions because it wouldn't have been the same in France. It wouldn't have been the same in Los Angeles and whatnot. And there's obviously there's different cultural and language and other kinds of concerns. So the weird thing is that we're still we're localizing our campaigns. But ironically, that global force that is working on those campaigns can be anywhere. How do you build a personal brand these days on social media that's successful? And how do you actually attract people's attention, get to show up in the algorithms and gain authority mm. in a sense? That is a big question that could be a whole day seminar. But let me say it this way. <clears throat> Back to what we were saying before about people being inundated with social media and being more content than whatever and brands feeling like they have to yell louder, right, to be able to stand out. Now consumers are so smart that they are allergic to ads. You and I, we can spot an ad a mile away, right? How many of our friends who are brand marketers say, I don't click on ads, right? So ironically, the, the ads that are the most successful are the things that don't look like ads. So I remember doing some stuff for the Golden State Warriors, which won the NBA championship for those of you guys who watch basketball. And one of the sponsors, so you have all these sponsors like the airlines and the banks that pay to have their ads in the stadium and pay for the commercials, right? And it's very obvious that those are ads, 
right, for the car companies. Like we had ads for Kia. Kia paid paid us money because Steph Curry, we went to honor him as like the player of the year, right? And it was obvious an advertisement where you see Steph Curry and he is driving a Kia. Do you think Steph Curry drives a Kia, Evo? No, he drives an orange Lamborghini <laughs> and I've seen it, right? Because I've seen him drive this Lamborghini around and he only did it for the commercial. And so that it's, it's kind of inauthentic in a way because people want what's real. So if you want to build a personal brand, you have to do things that are the exact opposite of what looks like a commercial. So what does that mean? Film on your cell phone instead of on a professional camera. Film without perfect lighting. Film even if you're not in this perfect environment that looks like a TV commercial. Say things that are more, that, that, if, that feel like you're more vulnerable instead of like, buy my stuff, buy my stuff. Right now it's on sale, 20%. So say other things like tell a story, talk about your children, talk about some concern that you have, right? Things that don't do the exact opposite of commercial. The former CEO of T-Mobile he actually hopped in on one of my clubhouse rooms. He came in like two or three times, which is crazy. And this guy, he's showing videos of himself grilling, you know, making margaritas, giving out laptops. He's wearing a black leather motorcycle jacket, doing things that are the exact opposite of like the CEO in the annual report, who's like very professional. As we move towards the end of our conversation, uh, one of the things that I was wondering about is um, if you could talk to um, all of the big CEOs in the world and you could um, tell them what should they spend the little bit of precious extra time that uh, they have on their hands, what would you tell them that uh, they should learn more about um, in the current uh, global economic and, and marketing environment? Labor is only getting more expensive. So your competitive advantage is in your people. We all know that, even if the economy goes south. And the best way is investing in your people so that they are an extension of your brand. Dennis, it was a pleasure to have you today. You have uh, a tremendous amount of knowledge and a tremendous amount of insights that I'm sure our audience will enjoy very much. So thank you very much for being on the Branding Boardroom. And hopefully we'll see you again very soon in China and perhaps uh, every quarter as well.